This is a Saddleback Church podcast. What is a revolution? One way to look at it is a sudden, radical, or complete change. Thank you to the Merriam-Webster Dictionary. Sudden. It came from almost out of nowhere. Radical. It was unexpected in its nature. A complete where it ends is entirely different than where it started. All of these statements, sudden, radical, complete, are true of the Jesus Revolution movement in the 1960s and 70s, where a culture of wanderers looking everywhere for truth and the buttoned-up church collided in Southern California, and Christianity in America was never the same. My guest today is John Irwin, the writer-director of Jesus Revolution, the hit 2023 film. John has directed a number of faith-based films, including I Can Only Imagine and American Underdog. And I talk with him today about the power of film as a storytelling medium, what he wants people to take away from Jesus Revolution, and lots more. Now, Saddleback is in the middle of an At The Movies series, of which Jesus Revolution is the final film. And you can hear John mention that in our conversation. My name is Jason Whelan, and this is Doable Discipleship, a Saddleback Church podcast, part of the Saddleback family of podcasts. Now, my conversation with John Irwin. John Irwin, thank you so much for joining me today. Really appreciate your time. Oh, thanks for having me. It's, <laughs> it's an honor. So today we're talking Jesus Revolution. Now, I wanted to start by asking, because you not only direct or co-direct your films, but you also write the scripts as well. So so how do you decide what stories you want to uh, to tell? Well, I you know, I would say that the great key to my career is in these um, two words that come before all the jobs that you mentioned, which is co CEO. Mm-hmm. So I co-direct, I co-write, I co-produce. And, you know, um, on the one hand, that's probably just me taking credit for the brilliant work of others. But, but on the other hand, it's, it's, you know, this, this, this is, it's a symphony of art and it's incredibly collaborative. And, you know, I've just found that if you, if you, if you learn to collaborate well, I think um, you can do so much more and, and, uh, You know, I like the story of draft horses. One draft horse can pull 8,000 pounds, two can pull 24,000, 32,000 if they train. And so there's this incredible, wonderful, collaborative uh, aspect to the filmmaking process. And then I think if you do it well, um, it just makes the product better. It makes the the journey better. and, uh, and, And you can do way more than you could alone. So on this particular film, I'm very grateful that I wrote, I wrote the script with John Gunn, um, and then uh, who, who is amazing, incredible storyteller. He, the movie he directed, um, Ordinary Angels, comes out later this fall. And, and, then, um, and then I co-directed it with Brent McCorkle, who was very instrumental in our, in our film, I Can Only Imagine. And, and, um, and he's also scored the film. And so much of his personality is infused into the movie. He's like a total hippie at heart. And you can feel mm-hmm. that. For me, the stories that we tell, it's just about, you know, it's about, for me, finding things that are incredibly and uniquely powerful. And um, if there's a movie that we've made, you know that there's been a moment in my life where the story just rocked my world and I couldn't stop thinking about it. And sometimes you just got to trust that simple inner voice that if something is meaningful and powerful to you, it will be to other people, you know? Mm-hmm. And uh, and I remember it was in twenty. 20- 14 or 15, we were working on a movie, first true story we ever did, um, Woodlawn. Mm -hmm. And uh, it it was set in the 1970s, a football movie. And it was a high school that was sort of um, saved from from, uh, racial violence through a spiritual awakening and in Birmingham, Alabama, where I grew up. And I was so awestruck by, I'm like, could this really have happened? Is this true? And that led to a greater discovery of the Jesus movement, where it was happening all over the country. And and I, I'm naturally an obsessively curious 
<laughs> I think that's the underrated virtue. Uh, and, and so I just sort of went on a Jesus movement bender and I discovered this time magazine from 1971, bought it on eBay, came into my mailbox all tattered, you know, <laughs> and, uh, carried it around for eight years, uh, as I wanted to make this movie. And I was so awestruck by the article, two things it was like this 10 page spread. It was buoyant. It was hopeful. It was optimistic. And it was this spiritual awakening that was happening uh, among young people all over America and like people that the established church at the time didn't really uh, uh, expect to be in church at all or really allow in church at all, which was the hippies. And I was so um, I just loved it. I love the story. It instantly reminded about like, you know, this movie for me is like a love letter to Cameron Crowe films, you know, like (laughs) uh, Almost Almost Famous famous. or Jerry Maguire just had that spirit to it, you know. And, uh, and I just felt like this needs to be a movie. And the other thing that struck me even then, and every year since then, it, it's become more apparent of just what a striking similarity there is in America today to America then. 1968 was just this year that the bottom fell out. of. Uh, it, it was a very, very hopeless, divided time. And, uh, and 1968 was sort of the, the bottom of that, the rock bottom of that. And that's where the Jesus movement came from. And I just think that we're, we're, we're in this very similar moment in American history where we're asking some very big questions of like, man, where do we go from here? And, uh, and, and the good news is we've been here before. And, and, uh, and I, I felt that, that the, the magazine and the story offered sort of a shining light of, of, of how we, of how God sort of rescued us in a very similar time and it offered a lot of hope. And so, you know, between every film that we made, this has been like a passion project that I've wanted to get made. So, was, you know, I can only imagine, I still believe American underdog and every, you know, <laughs> on set or in between all those films, like I just want to get Jesus revolution <laughs> made. And so, uh, and so it took a long, long time and, and uh, it's cool to see God's timing in it. I think the moral to the story there is if God's calling you to do something, you know, his timing's perfect, even when you don't see it and just, just don't quit. You know, th- there's a due season for every, uh, for every idea worth doing, you know, if God's calling you to do it. And, and I think uh, it was so cool to just not give up on it and then see the movie come out at, at just the right time and, uh, and, and, and be a part of this, you know, season of just, um, you know, Jesus back in the zeitgeist, yeah. you know, uh, and uh and 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 to and to play a role in that you know it feels like you're a part of something pretty cool yeah when i was prepping my intro for this episode i was looking up the word revolution and and what i saw from it is it was talking about that revolution is a a radical sudden a complete change and it really just hit mm-hmm. me that that this movie is really highlighting that that's what happened that there was a, a, a it was radical in that it was a completely unexpected way of th- of thought change. It was, yeah, sudden. It came out all of at once, s- right? Seemingly nowhere. Came out of nowhere. Incomplete. Where it was, yeah, what, people were different than they were beforehand. And it seems like that's a, a thing that you're capturing at, at, at that time, and that you're saying, well, um, that the, there can be a need for that even right now too. Yeah, we're 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 capturing it. You know, uh, we all have our gifts. I'm a storyteller. And, uh, and, you know, God gave me a camera and, uh, <laughs> you know, when you use your gift for something beyond yourself for God's glory, instead of your own, it's pretty vocationally, you'll never have as much fun, yeah. you know? And, uh, and we are trying to capture something that happened in hopes that it could happen again, you know, in our own lives in our own families in America today. And, and, and that was always the goal of the project, mm. um, you know, was, uh, was to get Jesus back on the cover of time. You know, what's interesting <laughs> is Jesus was just on the cover of Newsweek, you know, with a, with a slate which uh. said Jesus invades Hollywood. So our voice is definitely being heard, but, mm. but I do think that I, I love the, the, you know, I, we didn't call it this time magazine called it Jesus revolution. And, uh, way back then, but th- that word revolution is such an interesting thing. Cause you're right. It's this radical change. Also love is in the word spelled backwards, but, mm. but also, uh, you know, revolution is a return to something you know it's a cycle it's a it's a it's a revolution like as in a, a wheel would have revolutions you know mm. and uh and so i think there's also there's also something that that uh of getting back to something uh that 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 god did at a very similar time you know we've had these spiritual awakenings in america 
they're inextricably linked to the history of our country all the way back to the great awakening preceding the American revolution. And I just think that, you know, we find these places of that, we find these moments of desperation and man, where do we go? Where are the answers? Um, does my life have meaning and purpose, you know, and, and the worse it gets, the more we ask those questions. And I just think that we're, we're back there. And, uh, and, you know, I think it, it might sound like a cliche, but, you know, Jesus is the answer. He was then and he is now. And uh, so to just be able to try to tell that story well, to tell it in an entertaining way, to, to make a movie that audiences would love and that families could watch together. And, uh, you know, that, that's so much fun. I just thought the story had so much natural humor in it. And, uh, and you know, I remember when Greg Laurie said that, uh, you know, as a teenager, you know, from his perspective of watching Chuck Smith, and Lonnie Frisbee sort of meet, it was like nitro meeting glycerin, you know, <laughs> it's, it's a story that I deeply resonate, resonate with because it's a story of imperfect people caught up in a moment in time, doing something extraordinary to, together, mm. despite their imperfections, which I, I absolutely qualify for at all levels. And, and, uh, and so it, it was just a wonderful story and, and it was incredible to see the film work in a, in a way that really shocked us all, you know, at the box office yeah. and started you know, was a part of this year of just the return of uh, of our audience <laughs> yeah. to the cinema in a way that continues to shock the industry, even as we talk right now. That's so true. <laughs> That's so true. So you mentioned Greg Laurie. What was your process like for sitting down with Greg and with the other people who were around during that movement as you were writing the script and thinking about even just how you would shoot and frame it? Well, you know, they say a filmmaker finds their story and just tells it over and over again. And, uh, for us, inspirational true stories really are are what we learn to just love. Yeah. I, I think I haven't really counted them up, but I think we've done six of them in a row, mm -hmm. six seven of them in a row. And so there's a certain process, you know, that 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 we go about in adapting a true story. And uh, you know, we're documentary filmmakers before we're feature filmmakers, and so a lot of it is just doing the research, doing the interviews, and uh, you know. Greg and Kathy Laurie have just become incredible friends. Um, you know, I, I think I'm, I'm called to Hollywood and uh, to help, you know, like Caleb in the Bible, when he said, give me this mountain, you know, there's a group of us saying we want the mountain with the Hollywood sign on it back uh, as, as Christians and Hollywood's in, you know, that's important. It's an incredibly powerful medium. Uh, it's America's second largest export, you know, and it's an incredible way to tell a story, but it's not the hope of the world. You know, the local church is the hope of the world. And I think the American pastor is one of the most under celebrated, uh, uh, you know, members of, of, of American society. And, and, uh, and I, and I want to serve them, you know, uh, I, I like the idea of being their air force. Yeah. And so, um, I hold those relationships in very high esteem and, and, and Greg and Kathy are definitely, um, among the top of, of that list. And I just, I think they're great. We've become incredible friends and that friendship started way back when two things happened. You know, he has these events in Southern California, typically at Angel Stadium. And I was doing that movie Woodlawn and there's a moment where 42,000 people say the Lord's prayer together at the end of that movie. And, um, they were all digital. They were all computer people and they look good, but you know, they don't sound good. You know, they sound like, you know, this. And so we had to have audio of people of, of, of a mass crowd saying the Lord's prayer. And about a week before his, his, uh, his SoCal harvest event, uh, I had not met him before. And I, and I met him for two reasons. I'm like, I found this magazine. I'm hugely interested in the Jesus movement. I would love to, <laughs> to, um, uh, just talk to you about it. And, and, uh, and also I need you to just trust me and lead your uh, lead people in the Lord's prayer. And I'm going to bring all these microphones and record it for this <laughs> movie that I'm doing. And, and, uh, and, and it's, it's always the way I am, but we just struck up an incredible friendship and he's an incredibly creative guy. And we've done a couple docs together and, um, and a, a few projects together. And, but the whole relationship started around getting Jesus revolution done and made. And, uh, so it's so cool to to finally see that happen, and and uh, and they're just wonderful. He and Kathy both are just, and their whole family, wonderful friends, wonderful pastors, and um, you know, uh, I, I know it's 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 true of Saddleback as well. You know, when you when you have a a pastor that has served, you know, for 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 a very long period of time in a very faithful way, that's a rare thing, man, and uh, and a wonderful thing, and uh, 
and and it's true of of, uh, of Greg and, and Rick as well. And and uh, so it's good to it's good to as an entertainer uh, to serve that. But we just we formed a great relationship, and then we went all over the country because um, I didn't know at 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 first if it was a documentary or a film. Mm. And so we went all over the country just film, doing interviews with people that had experienced the Jesus movement. And, and um, the stories were just so profound and so profoundly unique. We did a documentary on Johnny Cash and I remember interviewing Johnny Cash's sister and hearing how she came to Christ. And it was such, it was so distinct. I'm like, that happened between 1969 and 1971, didn't it? He's like, yeah, how'd you know it was 1970? I'm like, I know the Jesus movement. And uh, she had such a radical version and, uh, and so I just think that I just became a student of the Jesus movement and something that we try to create in, in film quite a bit is, uh, you know, this, this br- amazing word FOMO, you know, fear of missing out. <laughs> yeah. I had the fear of missing out. Cause I'm like, I feel kind of gypped. I mean, I was practically born on the altar of a Southern Baptist church. You know, I was raised in Birmingham, Alabama, which is like the buckle of the Bible belt. Sure. <laughs> and, uh, you know, and, and I've never experienced anything like this you know, uh, nor has anyone in my generation. And so there just became a, a definite hunger to like, I really, I would love to experience something like this in our time. And I think we need it. Maybe we need it as much as they did then. And, uh, and so that became the, well, what's my role in that? It's just, to, it's just to make a great movie yeah. and to make it as great as I can and to try to begin the conversation again, um, of, of what revival could look like in our time. Yeah. And there's a quote from the very beginning of Jesus Revolution where Kelsey Grammer is playing a Chuck Smith. And he says, it's not something to explain. It's something to be experienced. And this is at the very beginning of the film. And that line seems to kind of paint a picture, not just of Jesus Revolution uh, itself, but of the opportunities that are presented in faith-based films of which you've been a part of so many of them. So do you see this as something that you strive for, for not just explaining, but but for creating experiences? Well, I think movies overall, for me, I, uh, are profoundly, the, the reason I go to the movies is to have an emotional experience. Yeah. It's this wonderful thing that, you know, most art is something that you derive meaning through observation. You, know, you look at a painting on a wall, you, you're observing the painting. Mass entertainment, film and television it's this magical thing. I still don't know how in the world I have the, have this job. Like I, I, I don't, it's a, I can't believe I get to do what I get to do. It's this incredible privilege um, to, to feel things deeply, to think of them, to see them in your head and also you know, to work collaboratively with a group of people. And then there they are on this gigantic screen and, and the audience is, is experiencing them as, as if they were real uh, film and television. There's this wonderful thing that we strive for and you, you hope to get to, uh, which is the suspension of disbelief. And that's when an audience literally is giving themselves to, to the movie and they're experiencing it vicariously there. You don't watch Indiana Jones, you become Indiana Jones, you, you know? And so it's this incredibly emotional experiential medium and it's very powerful because of that. So ultimately when I go to the movies, I go to feel something and I go to have a, a, a satisfying emotional experience with people that I love. And, and, uh, and so of course we, we want to create that. And to me, one of the things that we say with the, with the films that we make and, 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 and I, I consider it a great privilege to be a part of this revolution in faith-based entertainment. Yeah. Um, but we say, you know, we must first entertain it's, 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 that's the name of it. It's the entertainment mm-hmm. business. Uh, and my first uh, job is to do everything within my power to entertain you mm-hmm. and to make you laugh and cry and, you know, uh, cheer. And that's the job mm-hmm. first and foremost. And, and then hopefully by doing that, I can tell a story that's really meaningful that I believe is life changing. Mm-hmm. And, but only once I entertain. And if we're not entertaining, then what are we doing? Because it costs the same. This is not like the music business. In the music business, if I go see you 2 in concert, I'm going to pay $400 gladly for that ticket. If I go see, you know, an independent rock band, it, you know, it might be free (laughs) or a cover charge or whatever. And so in movies, you know, by and large, except for the difference in premium format, the, 
experience is, is the same amount of money for my movie as it is for Mission Impossible or Avatar. Yeah. And so I really want to just do everything I can, uh, you know, within our power to entertain the audience mm-hmm. and to give the audience an incredible experience, an emotional experience, and one that I enjoy. And I'll say this, I've never, I've never experienced um, a, a movie with an audience like Jesus Revolution. I mean, they, they, there were all these theaters where they're cheering during the film, you know, mm-hmm. and, uh, and crying and laughing. And, and, and that's just a great, it's a wonderful thing. Again, it, it's an incredible privilege. It's a hard job. It's a hard industry, mm. but it's an amazing, what we get to do is incredible um, because we get to, we get to entertain people and entertain people in a meaningful way. And then if you do it right, um, people, they, they want to change the way they, they believe often to match the way a great story has made them feel. Uh, and they want to participate in it. Most notably with this is, you know, um, not once, but twice there's been in the last 60 days, there's been thousands of people baptized at pirates cove, yep. which we filmed several scenes of the movie in. And I was just there, uh, it's 4,500 people baptized in a single day. And so many of the stories they're from all over the United States, but they'd seen the film and it had been, life changing in some way. And they actually wanted to participate in what they had seen. And that's just the sheer power of the medium. Mm. Um, I love in, in the book of Acts, uh, Paul says of David, I think I originally heard this from Rick Warren actually um, (laughs) uh, in a sermon, but that he uh, served the purposes of God in his generation. And the idea of sitting in between what's eternal and unchanging, which is, the purposes of God, the gospel, truth, and then what's constantly changing, which is your generation. Mm. And and I think sometimes we hold the wrong thing sacred. We hold like the 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 methods sacred. The methods aren't what's sacred. That changes. You know, the the message is what's sacred. And so it's fun to sort of own your time and say, what are the methods of my time to get this truth? to my generation. And, and I think that mass entertainment just presents a very powerful way of doing something very old, which is to tell story, you yeah. know, and it tells, and I think stories are, 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 have always been how we cipher the meaning of life, you know, and uh, that, that great question of, of is, do I have a purpose for my life? Does my life matter? Do I have a place in the story? Stories are how we, how we get at that, you know? And, uh, and so it's a very powerful thing and it's always been powerful. It's why Jesus was such a great storyteller. Um, mass entertainment just represents a profound leap in how to tell stories. And it's the most powerful method ever invented for telling stories. And so it's something that we have to be involved in and we have to give it our all. I mean, look, George Lucas said it best. He said, <laughs> films are never complete. They're only abandoned. So, you know, I, there's mistakes in all of our movies. <laughs> Typically I'm not able to watch them after they're completed for a long time, years, but, but we should try, we should really give it our all. And I think excellence should be this sort of unending quest. Um, and, and we should try to be constantly improving in, in every way we can. So that these stories can be as entertaining as they can possibly be so that they can really um, be an instrument in changing people's lives. And so, um, that's that's the very long answer to <laughs> yes the, the 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 goal is to give the audience and myself as a member of the audience the most profound emotional experience that that we can well and i think there's something powerful about the a community experience in it too that especially if you go to a movie theater you're sitting with other people typically and you're all experiencing this together as you said you heard stories of people who 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 would start cheering during the movie. Mm -hmm. And then what typically happens is then you leave the movie and you want to talk about the movie with the people that you saw it with, or you go and tell somebody about it. So, so then it it just keeps living because you're, it it, it creates this whole experience that you're enjoying this together. You're experiencing the, the story, the character arc, the emotional arc, whatever it is. And then you want to keep talking about it. So it's, it's a special medium in that way in that it, can it is meant to be done with other people yeah it's it's a it's a um community experience and movies are magical in that way and i just love to i mean last night i was in the movies with my whole family watching teenage mutant ninja turtles (laughs) it's pretty good you know and uh 
whether it's that or Barbenheimer or whatever, you know, it's, it's, it's just something to do together and, and, uh, in a really special way. And I love doing it. And, uh, and I also love really trying to, to make, you know, intentionally making the movies multi-generational, you know, Jesus revolution was designed to, you have this young love story you have Kelsey Grammer's performance and what he, this, what he does as a pastor and opening his doors to this audience that he doesn't understand. And you have Jonathan Rumi's incredibly nuanced performance and, and, uh, and an amazing performance. And yeah. you have different, but the architecture of the movie is there's different ways in for different age groups. And, and that's very intentional. And I remember at the premiere is my, my wife and I are sitting there with my daughter who's 14. Um, God help me. And, and, uh, <laughs> and, and then my parents, you know, so there's three generations and we're all sort of loving the movie together. Mm. And uh, there's nothing like that. It's great at home. And I was glad to see it yeah. in the top five on Netflix, yeah, uh, but, but, it's just there's something spectacular <laughs> about about watching a movie together with people that you love, especially Jesus Revolution. It was just the coolest group experience, you know. Um, and uh, and and there were so many stories of of, of conversations that were people getting baptized, like in a, in a <laughs> in a fountain outside the theater, or spontaneously doing sort of worship inside <laughs> a theater, or you know, I've never seen those type of stories um, happen to this degree. Mm. And, uh, and it's cool because what I can do for a pastor, for mom and dad, um, you know, and we all have gifts. And the point is that we should all use our gifts collectively towards a goal of, of, uh, of getting the gospel to the world mm. is I can create a moment. I'll give you the best example. Yeah. And I say, I, I'm talking about our team yeah. and, and the, the idea of what movies do with I can only imagine, I think there was a, a woman and her son watching it. I forget where they were. Um, and they were leaving the theater and there was a woman behind them in the theater that was sort of wrecked by the movie in, in a good way. And she just said, hey, are you guys Christians? And they said, yeah, great great to meet you, total stranger. And they said, uh, are you? And she said, no, but I just wandered into this movie because it's a popular movie. I'd heard about it. And, uh, and she said, uh, uh, whatever happened to Dennis Quaid's character in this movie, I need to happen in my life. And I just need someone to explain it to me. Can you please explain it to me? Mm. And, and they had this conversation there. The movie can't have that conversation, but the movie can set up that conversation. Yeah. And that's what I'm passionate about is um, we've even put these little things in the credits on our films of uh, a uh, Steve Douglas, uh, who used to run a uh, you know, crew asked me to do it. And uh, um, before he passed away and, 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 just said, Hey, you know, for a spiritual conversation, go to chat about faith.com or whatever. And I'm like, that sounds like a good idea. I don't think anybody <laughs> reads the credits, but yeah, why, why not throw it in there and see what happens? And it circled back. I sort of forgot we did it, put it in three movies. And I was like, you know, did, did anyone yeah. <laughs> read the credits? And they said, it's our, it's our highest engagement tool we've ever had. There's been 400,000 responses. Oh, wow. um, and so it just shows the power of the medium. It just yeah. shows the power of storytelling and that it sets up, conversations about um life and you know at the at the local level that are really really inspiring it, again hollywood the studio system entertainment it's a very difficult game it's yeah. it's, a diff it's a performance sport it's a difficult industry mm -hmm. it's cutthroat it's winner take all you gotta learn to swim with sharks and so just hearing those stories just that's what that's why we do it over mm -hmm. and over again that's why it's worth it you know is is the privilege to entertain people and then seeing lives changed as a result of the conversations that happen afterwards. Well, and that's something I was curious about too. And I'm so glad that you mentioned that story about that woman coming out of, I can only imagine, because I was curious how much time you spend thinking about having your movie speak to non-believers or speaking to believers. How does that play into your preparation for the movie? How you're thinking about the film, the writing of it, how does that all work together? So it's interesting that you asked that question because I, I would say the water cooler or the coffee shop conversation, um, you know, as we've been asking ourselves, like, what is faith-based entertainment? Yeah. Like, what faith in what? Faith requires an object. You know? <laughs> like, what what is this thing that we do? Or, or, or talking to uh, Sean Astin, I remember he said, I just hmm. feel like you guys are like pioneers and frontiersmen. We've done a couple of films together. And I'm like, thanks, Sam Wise <laughs> and Lord say, of the Rings yeah. and Rudy. Um, and... Uh, and he said, but you know, John, most frontiers are going to end up dying on the frontier, you know, before the settlers come in. I'm like, well, thanks, Sean. Uh, <laughs> that's, that's probably true. Well, well, the road, the, the trail will be clearly marked and they'll, uh, 
they'll name roads after us. But the point is, is like when you're innovating and when you're a part of that, you, you, you're just sort of trying to blaze a trail and you learn things as you go. A big question has been, um, you know, are we just preaching to the choir? Mm -hmm. And what we've learned actually is that the choir, first of all, I think the choir needs to be preached to. I, I, I yeah. say that as a member of the choir and we need, we need to have stories that draw us to the best versions of ourselves. But what we've actually learned is that we, we can, we can preach in essence through the choir. Mm. So what happens, it's this magical thing. What happens when, um, when we unify our voice together as Christians, it creates this amazing zeitgeist moment um, called FOMO, which is the fear of missing out. Yeah. And when a piece of entertainment cracks the top five movies in America or the top three movies in America, and there's all this press about like, what is this movie? There's this large, large audience of people that I'm also in yeah. called frequent moviegoers. And if you want to talk about, if you want to get under the skin of a frequent moviegoer, you talk about a movie they haven't seen because, you know, we pride ourselves in seeing everything and having an opinion. So when a faith movie cracks the top five or the top three in an unexpected way, here comes a wave of, of millions of people that are going to see it now just because it's the top, one of the top three movies in America. It happened with Jesus Revolution. It happened mm -hmm. with, certainly I can only imagine, happened in a profound way with Sound of Freedom. Yeah. And, and, uh, and it just tips. And so what we found is the first, you know, million or two people are our audience, mm -hmm. but the second, you know, the, the next three, four or 5 million people seeing it in theaters, uh, are not actually, and it's this magical thing. And we actually discovered it by accident and then it triggers foreign output deals. And so then the movie starts going to all these other countries and the, these countries are paying us for the movie for the right to translate it. And then like someone like Netflix comes along and they would have probably rejected the movie outright at, at its origin. But because it was one of the top movies in theaters in America, they paid large sums of money to have it on Netflix. And then it's in the top five on Netflix. And so there is this incredible um, effect towards the body of Christ championing something together. It's sort of like Joshua in the Battle of Jericho. The last step was the walls fell down when Israel unified their voice together at the same moment. And that happens. So I think it's essential to make a product that is accessible to anybody. You want to make it specifically to entertain an audience, but you also want to make it widely appealing. So someone, a friend of mine, um, uh, different, totally different type of movie, um, movies that I'm not the core audience for because <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm too skittish, but you know, Jason Blum has done yeah. that very well in the horror space with his company Blumhouse where yeah. it, if you're a fan of horror films, you know, whether it's Get Out or Split or, you know, Megan or whatever, you're going to love his movies. But once they tip and become these cultural phenomenons, you know, I can go see Megan. I'm not recommending this <laughs> to anybody but with my PG-13, yeah. with my 14 year old. I'd be like, OK, this was a good movie. This is a very good movie, you know, or, or, or you know, Get Out or whatever. Mm -hmm. These are some really well-made movies. Um, that's what we're trying to do in Faith, where if you love um, Christianity and you love entertainment, you know, we want to serve you. We want to make a great film for you. We want to make sure you can trust it, that it's not offensive, you know, um, and you can take your family to it. But then God willing, if this thing tips into popular culture, uh, like Jesus revolution did and people just start showing up. I remember talking to a Forbes reporter and he just said, um, he was, he was devoutly Jewish. And he said, every rabbi in America should see this movie. It's a different <laughs> religious context, but we're facing the same problem. Like yeah. how do we, reach out to teenagers. How do we take these sacred traditions and pass them down? And a lot of people th that were not Christians at all felt, felt like, you know, Jesus revolution was this great sort of parable on, on loving the other, you know, and, and loving people that are different than you and, and being willing to take the risk of spending time with people that aren't like you. And, and, uh, and, you know, it got a, it got an A plus cinema score, which is the highest grade a movie you can get from an audience. And it, it maintained that on, on Rotten Tomatoes where it's like 99% from the audience. And so um, it, you want to make something that's entertaining um, for as many people as you can make it for, even though specifically trying to serve your audience. And I think that that is entertainment at large these days, you know, um, there's really not much mainstream left. You just want to make a very bold, authentic version of whatever you're making and then make it as entertaining as possible. So we think a lot about what's that second wave of people. The other thing that I learned from Greg and his events in Southern California yeah. was that a lot of times evangelism happens when Christians take the step of saying to someone in their life, hey, will you watch this with me? 
will you come to this free event with me? And so what we want is we want an experience that those people love. And uh, we really try to cleanse it of any sort of um, Christian vernacular that can't be easily understood. You know, when we say, are you washed in the blood of the lamb? We know what we're talking about, but other people would say like, gross, what? You know, and so we want to make sure that we don't say things like that. And we sort of translate the story into, in, into a place where it's universally applicable. And yet we still don't, we don't, you know, I, I'm, I am, I am proud that Jesus is in the title of this movie. I'm proud that how overt, I guess, quote unquote, the baptisms scenes are in the movie, even though they're very organic and emotional mm. and, uh, and I'm, I'm unapologetic for what the movie is, but we want to make, um, we want to make it absolutely as entertaining as possible for, for the masses because they show up in mass uh, when the faith, when the Christian audience um, champions it loudly. Well, and I think people again, you don't have to be a a, a faith a, a person of faith to walk into the movie and kind of see yourself in some of these characters. Whether it's like a Gray who's kind of just lost trying to find themselves, or whether it's the uh, people from Calvary Church who walked out who were just like, no, this is you know, uh, this is not my scene. You know, maybe a bit more mm -hmm. buttoned up, or whether. It's Lonnie and his friend, and, and they're just like, hey, we, we see something different. We, we're we just trying to think of something different. I think there's, I think anybody can walk in and kind of see themselves in this place and be like, oh, yeah, like that resonates with me. I, 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 that's my story in a different context, but that's my story. And anytime there's two groups of people that are just completely different from each other, trapped in sort of an environment together yeah. or, you know, there's just, it's funny. It's naturally, you know, oh, yeah. it's, it's really funny, whether it's, you know, um, things like the odd couple or, or, mm -hmm. or Mork and Mindy, or even lethal weapon, you know, sure. e anytime that there's just polar opposites in a situation together, there's a lot of humor there. And, and I just felt like that was the nature of this story that on a dare, this pastor <laughs> played by brilliantly by Kelsey Grammer yeah. throws his doors open to this group of people that, he doesn't understand that many people in organized religion at the time would say like, here's the path to going to a church. If you're a hippie, like go home, run away, <laughs> clean up, cut your hair, get a job, become a functioning member of society. Yeah. And now maybe you can come to church. And he just said, come as you are yeah. come right now. You know, and I don't, I don't understand any of this, but I, but I'm, but I'm going to open my doors to it. And I think what's interesting is even people that, that don't, that aren't um, that deeply resonated with people um, no matter what they believed. And I think there's a scene in the film that I remember when we were doing the research and, and it was instantly like, well, that's the scene in the movie where these elders in the church were saying, get these kids out because they're staining our new carpet. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and the next week, Chuck Smith was washing the feet of these kids as they came into church. And it's just such a powerful moment yeah. in the movie. Um, and, and I think that there, it's deeply applicable to, I, I just don't think, I've been told in therapy, I should listen more that, uh, you know, people's primary needs are to feel seen and heard yeah. and understood, not necessarily agreed with. And I think mm -hmm. we've believed this lie in American society today that because we disagree on things, we can't see each other and we can't listen to each other and we can't be in a room together and we can't love each other. And that's just not true. Uh, and I think that there is a mass cultural yearning for moments where we can find a middle ground and a middle space and love each other despite our differences. And I have the good fortune of going back and forth all the time from the South where I was raised and live Nashville today, um, which is pretty close to Birmingham or where, yeah. where my wife's family still is and, and LA. And I just go back and forth and I, and I live in these two worlds and there's so much more that unites us that divides us. And, uh, and I think people are just yearning for that. And I think the film resonated deeply in that way, no matter what people believed. And, uh, and you can, you can put, um, I love this phrase in the declaration of independence that these two words that Benjamin Franklin added self-evident, you know, like measurable, we hold these truths to be self-evident. There's a lot of truth that is measurable, self-evident. It's, it's, uh, it, you know, it, it, these things are just true because we need them and because they work. And I think, the values on which Christianity is built are universally needed yeah. and, uh, and applicable today now more than ever. And if you tell a story correctly, um, all the films that you guys are doing in your, in your, at the movie series, you know, 
um, you know, Top Gun, Lion, I think Toy Story 4, yeah. you said there's just, there's universal truth. There's, 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 uh, th- there, there are truths at the bedrock of those stories that are life changing. You know, when Randall Wallace writes the word in the midst of this period epic action film, Braveheart, but every man dies, not every man really lives. That's life changing. You know, that, that's, man, am I living for my passion and my calling? Um, and I think that, that you can tell a story even specific to Christianity, like Jesus revolution, um, or just based off the values of Christianity. And you can tell it in a life changing way that will reach way more people than you think. I think these stories well told unify much more than they divide. Mm. I would love to do a very quick rapid fire question segment with you. This is just fun to talking about the cast of the movie. You have just this incredible cast in Jesus revolution who have done so many things. So I wanted to have a little bit of fun with their filmography a little bit for you. So great. <laughs> great. I hope I don't botch it. And they listen. No, no, no. You and, won't. Uh, no, but here we go. No, you won't at all. <laughs> um, okay. So we talked about uh, Jonathan Rumi. Uh, so, so again, you can take this any way you want. Uh, Jonathan Rumi as Lonnie or Jonathan Rumi as Jesus in the chosen. Um, you know, what's interesting is he's such a method actor. He's incredible that he sort of became Lonnie and it's sort of this whole different version to him. Mm. Um, you know, I think you got to go with him as Jesus first because he (laughs) was Jesus first. And I sort of like went to Dallas and was like, you know, could I borrow uh, some things from you in between seasons? Mainly Jonathan, (laughs) he's also that shoots the show, the the cinematographer. Mm. So But I would say I can't think, I think he has given a reimagined and definitive and authentic portrayal of Jesus that is Mm. so unique in the canon of those that have portrayed that character that that is absolutely his iconic and defining (laughs) role. And, uh, and it was great to get to sort of, uh, Ballroom from between <laughs> seasons, and uh, he crushed it as Lonnie, and a very different version of himself. You know, he did a great job. Love it. Uh, Joel Courtney, who I don't think we've mentioned yet in this podcast, but but uh, but he plays Greg. Now he came to prominence in the Kissing Booth movies on Netflix. So, which is your favorite of the Kissing Booth movies? Okay, so I've never taken the time. I'm sorry, Joel, if you're listening <laughs> to watch the Kissing Booth movies, but I know my daughter has watched them all because she flipped out when she oh, knew great. that we cast him and like rushed to the set. I'm sure they're great. Where I became a huge fan of Joel Courtney was his the first movie he ever auditioned for, um, and auditioned like it's like a bunch of auditions auditioned all over the summer, nearly quit. His dad told him to keep, he had no idea what the title of the actual movie was or who he was really auditioning for. Yeah. Uh, but it was for JJ Abrams and Steven Spielberg, yeah. which was in the incredible film, super eight, I love super which eight. I just love. And yeah. I think he's so I'm bawling at the end of that movie. I love that movie. And uh, that was his first uh, movie. I'm sure I would love the kissing booth <laughs> movies too, if I actually sat down and watched them. but I can guarantee you my daughter loves them all. And uh, apparently all equally because she was uh Geeking out. Very excited. <laughs> we mentioned Kelsey Grammer also. He's fantastic at, at, at playing Chuck Smith. Now, he's most famous for playing Fraser Crane. So, a Fraser in Cheers or Fraser in Fraser? You know, I I would say Fraser in Fraser um, because, you know, they just kept, it just kept going, going yeah. with the character. And, and I would say, too, uh, you know, there's very few people who can span like, cause this is what the role needed. And that's why he, <laughs> when we re- resurrect the project and uh, you know, after COVID and uh, I was able to uh, uh, direct it um, or co-direct it. He, he, I had one person on the Chuck Smith list and, and it was Kelsey because mm. when you can be Frazier, but you can also be like, you can be in Macbeth, you know, <laughs> yeah. and like Shakespeare in the park, that is like range. And what I love about, it's just the, the, the cadence of the way he says anything mm. is amazing. I could listen to Kelsey Grammer read the phone book. I wish Kelsey <laughs> Grammer was like the voice of Surrey on my phone. Maybe there's a way to do that. Or like my GPS voice. Like the way he says everything is unbelievable. And yeah. it's not really, I don't even know what to call it. It's almost like a, it's not mid-Atlantic. It's definitely American, but it's like, it's sort of like, 
it's Kerry its Grant. Own, yeah, he has like, his he own He just has tone. a way of it's its own thing. <laughs> and uh, and I would say Frazier is where it's most pronounced, but his whole body of work is incredible. And being able to write pieces of dialogue for him, and then especially some of those speeches and sermons in the film, and then the way he delivered them, I'm like, <laughs> who wrote this? This is actually pretty good. You know, he's just he's incredible. And uh, and uh, but yeah, I would say probably Frazier from Frazier. Love and it. by the way. They're they're resurrecting it. They're rebooting it. I was just going to say Paramount Plus. Yeah, the reboot's coming. We're all looking forward to it. There's a (laughs) Frasier plug. Um, Another name that we haven't mentioned yet is Kimberly Williams Paisley in the movie. Now she is most known for being in the Father of the Bride movie. So are you a Father of the Bride first one or a part two person? You know they're they're both really good. Uh, I watched Father of the Bride. You know we watched movies as a family. and uh a lot of old movies a lot of but but uh i'm a huge anything with steve martin martin short together (laughs) in it um is is a and i'm and i'm forgetting were they both in both of them that's my question yes they were whichever one of them has both of them okay if they're both in both of them whether it's like um only murders in the building now or like three amigos or you know (laughs) i just i love the two of them together in anything you know and uh and so I, I love both of them. I remember liking the first one more than the second. Mm-hmm. Um, I think she's great in both of them. But I also remember it being one of those sequels where it's like, okay, the sequel actually it's earned stands up yeah. and, and delivers and is earned and isn't like a cash grab. And <laughs> uh, and she's brilliant in both of them and uh, and really brilliant and connected deeply with this character yeah. and gave just a a beautiful performance and um, and 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 did a did a. That's a fantastic job. Love working <laughs> Last one for you in this segment. Now, I hope I wasn't the only person who watched this film to immediately notice Sean Weiss as the Vietnam vet who shows up asking for help in the church. So yeah. now Sean is famous for being in the Mighty Ducks movies. And so I immediately mm-hmm. was like, hey, it's Goldberg. So which is your favorite Mighty Ducks film? Uh well, there's just so many of them. Like I remember <laughs> loving them, you know, I remember him in them. Um, I remember feeling like I was a part of the team. Like that was our generations, like Rudy or, or like, yeah. or like uh, <laughs> Hoosiers or something. Uh, but at the end of the day, it, it seemed like it sort of went the way of police Academy. Like they it made did. a whole bunch of them, you know, and I don't remember it exactly did kind of. what's what now. Like there's so many of them that I'm like, so I'll have to go with the first one the because original. it's sort of a blur. Aren't there like a kajillion? <laughs> I don't remember. Maybe there's just a few, but I do, I do, uh, I do like those movies. And it was great with him. Um, and he shared this and, uh, uh, on his socials, and <clears throat> TMZ reported on a very, very yeah, cool I, story. I followed his story. Yeah, it's incredible. Um, you know, he had not acted for 14 years because he had a, a really, um, a, you know, a tough go. Uh, drug problem nearly killed him. Really ravaged his body and. And he's trying to get back into acting and and, and needed a, a couple credits to get back into SAG. And uh, so as an executive at Lionsgate called us uh, and we're like, hey, could you, you know, is there any speaking role? And we're like, heck yeah, man, we're all about I mean, the redemption stories are like the whole point of what we do. <laughs> and so uh, and so my co-director, Brent, had this great idea of, of sort of writing a, a mini arc of this um, of this Vietnam vet and, and based off a lot of the historical research at the time. Uh, and and a lot of true stories at the time and you know having this sort of deliverance um uh moment and uh and so sean played that role so well and and put so much of his own story in it and i remember when we baptized him at pirate co we were we were chasing the end of the day and you know the sun going down and uh and while we're filming um talk about life imitating art and vice versa while we're filming jonathan and joel and this baptism between lonnie and greg the real Greg Laurie was like a few hundred feet away. Nobody knew uh, because he had struck up a conversation with Sean and he was baptizing Sean. Uh, and it was a very meaningful moment for him as he, as he comes back to the, to, to our industry and uh, great to work with great guy. And I love the mighty. I remember it's one of those things oh, as a yeah. kid, you know, you just, I'm a, ger- I'm, what do they call it? I'm a geriatric millennial, <laughs> which is like a, a year one millennial. We, we've gotten old. Uh, but, uh, but I definitely remember the mighty ducks and, uh, and, and, and loved it. These are not short answers to anything. Sorry. I, I have a hard time. <laughs> no, please. So I, I just want to say 
Uh, congrats on the amazing success of Jesus Revolution. I'm sure the studios are all thrilled w- with how it went. Is, is there something else in the works that we can be looking out for? Ordinary Angels. There's a movie, my co-writer on um, on Jesus Revolution, John Gunn. We've written four films together. Uh, uh, wrote American Underdog together, and I still believe together. Uh, uh, he directed uh, the movie Ordinary Angels, which is it's incredible. It comes out October 13th. Uh, Hilary Swank. Uh, uh, stars in it as does uh, Alan uh, from from Amazon Prime's uh, Jack Reacher series, which oh, he's wow. he's a strong believer, great guy, um, a car from Granite Mountain. My yeah. gosh, that guy! But, but it's a it's a true story about a, a church and an entire community coming together to save the life of of, of one little girl mm. um, in in the midst of of what is Louisville's worst snowstorm, mm. um, and uh, she needs a liver transplant. They get her out, you know, and it's a story of just. What I love it, it following up Jesus revolution is, is a story about, you know, community serving and, uh, and the church being what we're supposed to be. And it's a, it's definitely like an Aaron Brockovich style uh, movie. She's Hillary's so great in the film and it actually scored is the highest scoring movie we've ever done. It, oh. it, um, for about a week, Jesus revolution was the highest scored movie we ever had in testing. And then, we tested ordinary angels and it scored higher, which is like a 97, which yeah. you can't, you can't really score higher. I think they, yeah. they said they only seen that once mm. in the last 10 years um, of testing movies. And, uh, and you're going to love it. It will be ready to laugh and cry and cheer. It's really amazing. And uh, uh, Lionsgate's uh, uh, putting up his fall. Love it. Well, again, congrats, John, on all the success with Jesus Revolution. Really appreciate your time. If you have not seen Jesus Revolution yet, what are you doing? Go out and see. As you, as John said, it's in the top five right now on Netflix, so you can watch it there. Watch it on Netflix. Free. <laughs> and then buy it, you know, if you want after that. Exactly. Whatever you want to do. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. John, I, I appreciate your time so much. Thank you so much. Hey, thanks for for championing the films and, uh, and, and watching them. And God's doing, look, I, I've not ever experienced a moment in time like we're in right now, God is doing incredible things. Christianity is making its great comeback in the entertainment industry. And the reason is our voices are so loudly heard. And so I'm, I'm very, very grateful to, to the audience and uh, to letting us do what we get to do. There's much more to come. And, uh, and it's amazing to see God, God work in the industry uh, at a unique moment in time. So, so uh, uh, onward. And I'm, and I'm glad you enjoyed the film. Now, let's look at some doable steps out of this episode. This one should be pretty easy and fun. Watch Jesus Revolution. As we mentioned, it's on Netflix as of this recording. Or you can buy or rent the film. But don't just watch it alone. Watch it with other people, with your friends or your family. And then talk about it. Where do you see yourself in the film? And do you see how the themes of this film translate to today, like John talked about. I want to thank my guest today, John Irwin. This has been Doable Discipleship, a Saddleback Church podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, consider giving us a rating or review on iTunes. If you do, you'll help other people find us in the future. You can also listen to these episodes on YouTube. Just subscribe to the Saddleback Church YouTube channel for these conversations, plus lots of other video content. And if you are already listening to us on YouTube, subscribe to the Doable Discipleship podcast on Apple Podcasts or your favorite podcasting app so you can listen in the car or wherever else you go. Don't forget to visit saddleback.com slash doable to check out all of our previous episodes and go to saddleback.com slash grow to find spiritual growth resources and view a calendar of upcoming events lastly you can always get in touch with us by emailing maturity at saddleback.com send us your thoughts send us your questions your bible questions your life questions whatever who knows your question might just inspire an upcoming episode Thanks again for tuning in to Doable Discipleship. I'm Jason Whelan, and I hope you'll join us again next week.